This is the seminar on Biblical Interpretation. I'm Larissa Preuss, and with me is Dr. Frank Hazel from the Biblical Research Institute. Dr. Hazel, what is the theme, or should I say the themes, we will be studying today? Faith, science, and the Bible. Now, that is something that has occupied the interest of many scholars and theologians over the centuries. This intricate uh, relationship between faith and science and the Bible and biblical interpretation has led uh, to, to big conflicts in church history. It has been often very controversial. Can the Bible really be trusted in scientific questions? Uh, isn't there a, a big uh, contradiction between faith and science? Can people who um, who are believers really be true scientists and vice versa? And uh, and things like that. And what is the nature of science? And and how does that uh, impact uh, our understanding of the Bible and the interpretation of the Bible? And is the Bible just a, a book for theology? Or can it also provide reliable uh, history and scientific information for us when it comes to the creation of this world and uh, life on this earth and things like that. And who is sharing this content with us? This content is shared uh, by Dr. Leonard Brand. He is not a theologian, but he is an accomplished scientist who teaches at Loma Linda University. He is a professor of biology and also paleontology. And he has published many books, uh, one textbook that is used for colleges and universities on faith, reason, and earth history. And he has uh, published many other books more recently and uh, uh, has published more than 40 uh, scientific research papers in, uh, in, in peer-reviewed uh, journals, etc. So he is eminently qualified to talk uh, about that relationship between faith and science and the Bible and, uh, and can share from his own experience and interaction with other scientists how uh, that has uh, influenced our understanding of science and what we have to be aware of when we talk about science and faith and the Bible and how we understand the Bible. Joining us now is Dr. Leonard Brand to address the topic of faith, science, and the Bible. Dr. Brand, does philosophy have any role in determining scientific conclusions about origins? A philosophy. I thought science was supposed to be just straightforward, collect data and get conclusions. Actually, it's not that way. Philosophy has a very important role in science. And to understand what that means, we will use a couple of illustrations. If I want to know if goldfish need oxygen, I can put them in a bowl, seal up the bowl so there's no oxygen, and then I will find out. That's a straightforward scientific experiment. It gives me an answer. They do or they don't need it. Okay, what if, I, if um, somebody tells me the evidence says that birds evolved from dinosaurs, right? What does that mean? Did they do an experiment that shows them that creation didn't work but they evolved from dinosaurs. No, that's not the way it worked. They, they first of all, start with a couple of assumptions. That's where the philosophy comes in. Assumptions are things you, you accept, you believe without having the evidence to demonstrate them. Okay, so they, first of all, one of the assumptions is there's no creator. There was no such thing as creation. You start with that. And then what you're trying to find out is what's the most likely animal that could give rise to birds? And, and how do you do that? Well, you just, you just look at their, compare their anatomy, compare their structure. Okay, birds in their structure are more like reptiles than they are like mammals. So birds couldn't come from mammals. And of the reptiles, you do a lot of comparison of, of anatomy and you, you see who is most similar to whom. And it turns out the reptiles that are most like birds in their anatomy are certain of the small dinosaurs. So, so you're asking, we know there's no creator. And so of the different possibilities, what could birds come from? Well, just from an anatomical comparison, 
uh, they would be most likely dinosaurs. So that's that's the difference. That there's this these philosophical assumptions come first, and the, there's this role of philosophy in in science, science of origins especially is the, the biggest thing about science that most people do not understand at all. And so it's important that we, that we do get an understanding of this, that philosophy, assumptions, uh, theories, they really come first when you're talking about origins. And then within a certain philosophy, a certain assumption, a certain theory, then we decide what are our best options. And so, you know, if somebody says birds, the evidence says birds evolved from dinosaurs, we don't need to be afraid, well, maybe they ruled out creation. No, they didn't do anything of the sort. They just chose from certain options and dinosaurs were, were most likely within their philosophy. If a scientist is adequately knowledgeable about the science of his or her field of research, is there any way that their being favorable to creation or catastrophic geology can give them an advantage in research? Most scientists and philosophers will tell you, well, that's a joke. Creationists cannot be um, a good scientist. But in reality, uh, they're missing something very important. I've been doing geology and paleontology research for 40 years, and I, I routinely allow the Bible to help me to understand what I'm doing. Okay, and how does that work? Uh, first of all, a little introduction of how it, how it works. We talk about worldviews, different ways of looking at the world and understanding the world. And so a creationist worldview is one, a materialist or naturalistic worldview is another. I read a lot in the anti-creationist literature, the books and articles and things that, about, that are putting down on creationists. And one thing is very clear to me, the, the people who write that know almost nothing about how an educated creationist thinks. But um, I have an advantage that they do not understand. I've never seen a, a materialist scientist who understands this. And that is, I, I read what they write and I read their, their anti-creation material. And it's clear that they understand their worldview, they understand their theory, they know nothing about mine. But to, do, to be a creationist and to do science, I have to know their worldview. I have to know all the de evidence that they're using. And I have to know how they're interpreting it and why they're interpreting it that way. So I have to know those things. So they know one worldview. They have no idea about mine. I know, I and my other creationist friends know two worldviews. We have to understand two worldviews and we routinely compare those and look for ways that we can find places to test between them. Okay, they're not doing that at all. And what I'm doing gives me a distinct advantage. To give you one example, I did research for some years on some fossil footprints in the Coconino sandstone, which is in Arizona. And um, most geologists are very convinced that the Coconino sandstone was formed in a desert. Desert wind blew all this sand into sand dunes and made the, the sandstone. They're very convinced of that. And so the footprints would have to have been made on desert sand dunes. Well. I don't start with that assumption that this was a desert. That desert theory would take tens of thousands of years. So I, I obviously can't accept that. So I could just start out and say, well, I assume it, or, 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 it happened in the flood, but there's a better way. I can look at their theory and, and compare it to mine. And my, the Bible opened my mind, opened my understanding that there could be another way uh, that's not a desert that they're deposited in water. And so I compare those two and I look for ways to experimentally uh, determine, I'm just probably not with experiments. Well, yeah, with experiments and with observations, um, what's the best explanation? And it, the more I've studied it, the more clear it is that um, for this to happen underwater is fits the evidence a lot better uh, than, than a desert. And so the Bible, open my eyes and my mind to think of new ways of understanding the, these rocks and these fossils. And so that happens just routinely when we do research uh, in so many ways. We, uh, uh, some colleagues and I have studied fossil whales in Peru for about a decade. And these fossil whales, they're, they're down there in the desert, there are thousands of these whales, literally, beautifully preserved whales. 
And the people who studied these before we came there were convinced that this, that the material that buries the whales accumulated just a, a few centimeters each thousand years. Okay, so how long would it take to bury a whale? Many thousands of years. But whales, when whales die, they are gone. Their skeletons and their body is all gone in a few years. It just can't be that whales took 10,000 years to get buried. Well, why didn't the other people notice that? Did, why didn't they pay attention to that? They, they're quite sure that they know how long it took, millions of years. And so they're not asking that question, uh, how long, how can you preserve the whales that well when it takes so long to be buried? They're not asking that question. But the Bible opened our thinking to ask that question, to, to ask new questions that others are not asking. And that gave us a distinct advantage in our research. And when we had all of our evidence, even other scientists could see that we were right. These had to be buried very quickly. And so that is how the Bible can give us an advantage. It opens our mind to new ways of thinking, uh, new questions to ask, uh, which others are, are not asking, or at least they're not noticing some of these things. In the past 40 years, has new scientific evidence posed more of a challenge or more support for belief in um, creation or catastrophic geology? Some years ago, well, probably 15 years ago, I was giving some talks to a group of, of teachers. And one of them asked me um, why it is that evolutionists seem to be being more confident of their belief now than before. Is there more evidence? Are they, are they finding new evidence now? And um, I told them what I thought at that time, but now I could give them a much stronger answer than I could then. Because in recent years, the last five, 10 years, maybe more, things are changing a lot in science. And the evidence for evolution is not getting stronger. It's running into serious problems, actually. You think about back when Charles Darwin was, was writing his book, he and his colleagues knew absolutely nothing about what a living cell is, what makes something alive. They had no idea. It just hadn't been studied yet. But it, in, um, well, molecular biology kind of got going in about 1950, roughly. And it's just been exploding in recent years. And it's more and more obvious that Darwin's theory of random mutations and natural selection cannot make something new. It, it just can't. The cell is too sophisticated. The genetic system is, is too incredible, too sophisticated for that to be true. And there is coming to the point where there, there's a, a conflict within science. And so I'm talking about people who are not even creationists, but they're, they're the discipline called evolutionary biology. They uh, are starting with the assumption that all life is a result of evolution. That's their philosophy. That's their starting assumption. And they're, they're not willing to question that. But there's a, there are other scientists, especially molecular biologists, who are realizing that Darwin's theory just doesn't work. Random mutations don't work. They won't do anything significant. And so you have this conflict brewing between evolutionary biologists and molecular biologists and others. And so it's becoming more and more obvious that Darwin's theory just simply cannot produce anything new. E evolution makes changes. New species can, can develop. Changes occur within species. They adapt to new environments and they change. They look different. They act different. But how do you invent feathers? How do you invent bones, uh, livers, kidneys, brains? Uh, how does that happen? Natural selection does absolutely nothing to make something new. Natural selection only eliminates things that don't work very well. What you have to have to invent feathers is, is um, change, change, genetic changes that start making this new thing. And random mutations just can't do it. They won't, don't cut it. And so there, thus you have this conflict growing uh, within science. And so we don't have to be, uh, you know, there years ago, maybe 20, 30 years ago, I remember we had a lot of questions. We didn't understand how we could answer these questions. Well, that's, that has changed dramatically. Those scientists, those evolutionists who are willing to face reality have serious problems. They don't, they don't have answers to how this can all happen. So the evidence for creation is growing stronger the evidence for Darwin's theory is, is fading. When we ask specifically about evidence for how the first life forms came from non-living matter, has increasing evidence provided more or less support for a naturalistic origin of life? 
this is another area where the evidence is changing dramatically and and yet philosophy has a ruling role when i say ruling a lot of people object to that it has a controlling influence a very strong controlling influence how of how for how data are interpreted you read any textbook any standard textbook uh, and it says confidently that life evolved uh, from non-life and it doesn't even ask about a creator it just doesn't assume that there was any it assumes there was never such a thing the things you hear on 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 online or on the media popular media uh, popular books they all confidently try to explain how life came about from non-life so what's the evidence for that absolutely none i mean that's that may seem like a strong statement but there is no evidence no scientific evidence to support that it's all ph philosophy it's assumption it's based on the assumption that there's no creator and thus life had to come about uh, by this some kind of long process. And you know, you, you either, what can they do? They either have to uh, stay with their theory of abiogenesis, um, life evolving, not evolving, but life coming about by itself. They have to stay with that or they have to admit there must be a creator. And if, you, if you're very committed to your philosophy of um, naturalism, materialism, you just can't make that step. You can't, it, it, it's not possible to do that. So scientists either accept the idea, the assumption that life has come about by itself, or they have to change their belief system, change their worldview, or they have to kind of pretend. And, and there are scientists who, who know that they will lose their jobs if they recognize possibility of any kind of creator. And so they just keep quiet and keep doing their work. So there are various approaches that people take to this, but the evidence is, is just astonishing, uh, astonishingly showing that life cannot come about by itself. We talked about what's in those cells, uh, sophisticated uh, cells. Uh, the, it's incredible what's inside of a living cell. It's like a whole city full of, full of factories or laboratories doing incredible things, many of much of which we don't even understand. And uh, for this to evolve is, is really not a realistic option. But science does, does not want to uh, recognize that. It does not want to admit that. How can we bring the Bible to dialogue with scientists and scholars? I had a graduate student once. I'll, I'll take this approach first and then and look at it another way. Uh, this, this graduate student asked me, what are the best arguments to use to win an argument about creation? And I told him, none, that's the wrong approach. You need to first become the person's friend. And if they then come to a point of starting to ask questions about creation, then you be ready to give thoughtful answers. And what you're asking is a very hard question. It's hard to reach people about these things when they're so committed and they've been educated all their lives. And for generations, the people have been educated to think a different way than creation. We just have to be friendly, be people's friends, don't argue, and, and hope that they will come around to asking questions. You can tactfully maybe say things to try to bring the issue, issue out, but then not, don't argue. Uh, hope they'll come to the point of asking questions. If they do, then we have a chance to get somewhere. Otherwise, we probably won't. But when, you, when we do have a chance, to, if they do start asking questions and we have a chance to talk about it, these questions about origin of life, molecular biology, those are very, can be very uh, important. One of the, the, the fam most famous British atheists was Anthony Flew, F-L-E-W. Okay, he was a very convinced atheist all his life. As he was quite older, he wrote a book. That title was, There is No God, but the word no had been crossed out. It said, there is a God. Okay, so what changed his mind? It's this matter of molecular biology intelligent design. He read about that, studied it, and he, he realized finally that there's just no way that life is going to come about by itself. And there are a lot of young scientists who, for whom intelligent design is having an influence. And still the majority, of course, of scientists are very much against it. They'll argue and say you're, you're foolish if you believe it, but it is having an influence. So that's one approach that can be, be helpful. 
But of course, I think also just our lives, the way we live is important. Do, they, do people see something in us that they, that they see appealing? Uh, and that can bring them to the point of asking questions. For quite some time, science has become the source of authority in determining the veracity of things. Would this resistance towards accepting the Bible be a matter of heeding to authority? Yeah. This issue of authority, I agree, is very important. And in, in past centuries, there was a time when, when the Western world pretty much believed in creation, believed in the Bible. And why did that change? Well, part of it was a movement away from accepting authorities accepting ancient authorities. And of course that, the Bible got tossed in there and the, and the authority of the Bible then was questioned and doubted. So how do you get around that? Yeah, you're asking an important question. And uh, like we mentioned, our, our lives are important. Uh, just how we relate to people, we, we cannot be mean and, and argumentative. I know a geologist who has argued in the literature with me a little bit about some specific evidence, but we became friends. And he and I spent several days out in the desert looking at the rocks and fossils together. He's an atheist, clearly an atheist. But he, we got to know each other and trust each other as scientists. And that trust carried over to other areas. And he, was, he asked questions like, what is heaven and what is hell? What is salvation? We had, we had some wonderful conversations. I don't know what the end result will be. But people need to somehow get to trust us one way or another. And then we, we might have the opportunity to ask and to, to well, ask questions and to, to give uh, thoughtful answers. And it, and it, uh, it can work. Our, our lives are important. Uh, they have to see something that they want. We need to know our Bibles carefully. Uh, there are, I think there are quite a few scientists who maybe were religious and they just can't believe some things like an ever burning hell. They can't, they can't be, a, you know, there's, God like that, I'm not interested in. And so we need to, to know answers to many things and be ready to, to speak to questions that they may have, criticism they may have. And it'll be different with every person. You know, Jesus had some, some harsh things to say to some people, but those were always self-centered, self-righteous people who were not willing to listen. Anybody who was willing to listen, he addressed them in kind, uh, ways and winning ways that that, that had a uh, you know had an influence on them. So we have to be ready to to follow his example. So in the end, could we say that even science requires faith? Is it really all a matter of faith in the end? Everybody has faith. A lot of people don't understand it. Uh, I've heard some arguments that said strongly, uh, you know, scientists science doesn't require faith. Religion requires faith. Well, that that's not true. Uh, they have faith in a lot of things that they don't have evidence for. And the Bible is not a textbook of answers, like you say. It's, it's stories. God gave us stories. We need to be willing to learn from those stories. And, and most of all, we have to know God, to know what kind of a being he is, and know that we can trust him. You, like you say, you can't prove that God is. You can't prove that he isn't. Only if we have confidence in him as a personal being, are we likely to come to the point of really trusting that the Bible is true and is reliable? God claims to have seen all of earth history, to know what it's all about. Are we willing to trust that? Do we know him so well that we can trust that? And then we can reach out to people, try to help them to understand who God is and come to trust. You know, God doesn't give us all the answers. If he did, I'm not sure how that would work. I've heard it said that, that some people will be lost by 18 inches, the distance between their head and their heart. We can know a lot of things from the Bible, but, uh, but not really be a Christian. We have to, it's like a marriage. You, if you know all the right things about your spouse, I mean, that's nice, but unless you love them, it, it doesn't really mean much. And, and religion is not dramatically different from that. It's a, it's a love relationship with a person that we've come to know, trust. And so that, that has to be an important part of it. And you don't have that kind of a faith in science. A person who has a lot of faith in the scientific conclusions can feel very confident, but it's not, it's not reassuring. It's so different from, from trusting and knowing God. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Brand, and thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. For a deeper understanding of this topic, go to AdventistBiblicalResearch.org slash store and buy the book Biblical Hermeneutics and Adventist Approach. For additional resources, visit AdventistBiblicalResearch.org.